Chancellor. Yeah. So, was, well, number one, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, Vancouver is one of those three great cities. I think, you know, San Francisco, Vancouver, and Sydney, Australia have that similar feel centered around uh, the water. And the first thing I note is that I, I feel like I'm looking here, and I'm like, well, what's, what's going on here? You guys need to get up and come on over here. Come on, let's get up. Here we go. Come on. Uh, we're going to change the mode here, okay? Because I can't look at both places. Everyone's... And come on down lower, otherwise I feel like I'm talking to two audiences. Come on. We're going to change this grand rounds. We're going to sit together so you guys can interact. I take it these are the attendings and these are the residents. Is that how it is? Yeah. yeah. I'm breaking the barrier. I'm breaking the barrier. Move on over. Come on. So, yeah, right. So what I thought I'd do today is to sort of talk a little bit about the systemic implications of urinary stone disease. And when we see a stone, like we talked about yesterday with the residents, uh, the fun part is dealing with the surgical aspects. But we all know that when you look up in the kidney and you see a randal plaque and you got the stones out, you know it's just a matter of time until they come back. And it's only when you've stayed at a place for 25 years like I have that you realize people still come back. And we have to understand why patients continue to come back with stone disease and try to address the systemic implications of urinary stones. This is not really a surgical disease. I mean, you may do a nephrectomy, you may do a few URSs, you may do a couple perks. You're not going to render this person stone free, okay? And it's unusual for these people to ultimately result in dialysis or uh, require a transplantation. So I don't think a stone is a stone. And for me, when I see my clinic with all these stone formers, I'm looking them when we get the patients together as a group or individually, trying to look at different aspects of urinary stone disease. So I'm just going to give you an example, similar to what you guys presented to me yesterday. 55-year-old female, remember females are uh, uh, half the amount of females and males have stone disease. Uh, it's supposed to be a percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Stone is mixed. It's not really 100% of anything. Uric acid, calcium oxalate, no flank pain, hematuria, you pat yourself on the back, everything's doing well. This is sort of what the stone looks like. We did an upper pole and a lower pole puncture. I sort of showed that to you yesterday. But when you look at the history, they had shockwave lithotripsy, you know, maybe eight, nine years ago, had a URS subsequently, and had no metabolic evaluation. Looking at the aspects of that men's health initiative that you guys are doing here, we as urologists need to look at the whole patient. We've got to get beyond just dealing with the surgical aspects of the disease. So what are the aspects? You ask them family history. We talked about that a little last night. My mother had stones, okay? How big a deal is that? My brother had a stone. You do the review of systems, it's negative. And his, interestingly, what we find, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, angina. These are not an unusual patient. Glyburide, lisinopril, a little hydrochlorothiazide, aspirin. This is pretty much routine patient. Married, two children, emigrated from Japan, probably similar to what you guys have up here in Vancouver. Owns a bookstore, smoked in the past, has a small amount of social uh, alcohol, uh, ingestion and we always have asked how people sleep and we talked about that a little last night. The patient's five foot three and a very svelte 183 pounds. BMI is 32. Blood pressure important to have and heart rate. Abdomen's unremarkable and the KUB shows no residual stones so you high five everybody, the patient leaves and you think that's it. So is there a need for a further workup? Work up? What do we do now? Some people do a parathyroid hormone, uh, calcium, uric acid, electrolytes, look for RTA. You look at a 24-hour urine, you could do it here in Canada, you could do it with Litholink, you could do it with uh, LabCorp. I mean, there's lots of, you know, commercially available type stuff. But historical thinking is that you treat these abnormalities. You look at the electrolytes, you look at the 24-hour urine. But what have we really learned, you know, about metabolic stone disease uh, in the past 10 years? And I'm going to make the statement is that systemic disease is a risk for stones, and equally important, stones are a risk for systemic disease. So let's go through, in my mind, what I believe are the issues and where's the data. Let's look at hypertension. Let's look at diabetes, obesity, and the whole metabolic syndrome. Let's look at gender. I think there's data to support all those aspects. We need to look in a very constructive fashion. We need to look at sleep position. I think it's very important. We need to look at the history of angina or other atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease processes. A family history of stones. How do we study that? Okay, and race, and we see that all. I look here, I see lots of different races. We see that uh, in San Francisco. If you go to the Midwest, you may not see that as much. 
So let's go through these individually. Let's look at hypertension. Hypertension, the epidemiologic evidence shows that patients with hypertension are at risk for stones, and stone formers develop hypertension. And you won't get that by just sort of having the patient coming in and out of the office. You've got to specifically look at it. So there's two good studies to support that. One looking at 503 men with an eight-year follow-up, showing a relative risk. Is there a pointer here? Uh, 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 on my computer. Okay. The, here you can see the relative risk is about 90% uh, increase. Borgi says lots of different studies. He has a different subset of patients. Almost a five-fold increase if you have hypertension and develop stones. And equally, look when you look at the healthcare professional study with 50-some thousand men with long-term follow-up, they found that the relative risk, if you have a stone to develop hypertension, is about 30%. This is huge. That if you have stones, the likelihood of you developing hypertension is 30% over those that don't have stones. This is big data. The proposed mechanisms are hypertensive patients will leak calcium from the nephron. I think that's legitimate. There's some good data to support that. And hypertensive subjects with a variety of other studies look at less citrate, more uric acid, more oscillate, and people who have a stones and hypertension have increased dietary sodium. So sodium is a big issue. Proposed mechanisms. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of, the, no, one of the, the, the classic issues with hypercalcerity. You treat them with chlorothalidone or hydrochlorothiazides. Uh, with the proposed mechanisms, uh, with the hypertension, it could lead to an obstructive uropathy that causes renal dysfunction, or you could have direct injury to the epithelial cells that Ben and I know a lot of the research that's going on on that. So I think, in fact, hypertension is one of those things we can hang our hat on. When you see a patient in the clinic, you need to document what their high blood pressure is. And if there is high blood pressure as a urologist with the Men Health Initiative, we need to initiate treatment or initiate a dialogue with the primary care doctor to initiate treatment of hypertension. Second, diabetes mellitus. Women with diabetes mellitus are at risk for stones. And in general, stone formers are at risk for developing diabetes. I want you to think about the patients. And when you see these stone patients in the clinic, I want you to think in these terms. You'll realize all of this, these facts are relevant. Looking at the healthcare professional's data, older women had about a 30%. Younger women had the bigger. We, we showed that almost 10 years ago. Men, probably not. So it seems as though maybe the association with diabetes, maybe the, the women with stones have a higher BMI. We have looked at that data and other people have also. You also can look at if you have stones, the instance of uh, uh, developing diabetes increases 30 to 40%. This is a real association. Proposed mechanisms here, increase uric acid production, decrease urine pH, average pH, I'm for average pH in the urine, we talked about yesterday. Five what? 5.75, 5.8. So remember, pH is less than 5.5. Every, every month, one of my stone formers, we have a little sheet. We have the pH and all those goodies. pH less than 5.5, uric acid, cysteine, pH greater than 7.2, struvite, in between is everything else. Okay. Uh, so you have decreased urinary pH, will impair renal ammonium production, a lot of work going on in that, and elevated uh, glucose, which will decrease renal calcium reabsorption and increased filtered load of calcium, all in the proximal tubule. So we looked at our 24-hour urines uh, over the last year when Brian Eisner was with me, and we uh, adjusted for all the goodies with age, gender, race, diet, hypertension, obesity, and we found that diabetes is no unequivocally associated with increased uh, urinary sodium and decreased urinary pH. So we've all heard about the study before Joe Segura died. They did the study at the Mayo Clinic and sort of said, you know, if you do shockwave with the HM3, that there is increased hypertension and diabetes. I think they blew it on that study. They didn't realize that stone disease in general increases the likelihood of diabetes and hypertension. And now data shows that there is no real true association with the shockwave. It is intrinsic with stone disease in general. And I think their conclusion was wrong. The study was interesting, but it has nothing to do with shockwave. And I know Joel, Ben, and I have had a lot of time talking to people that shockwave is not going to have an impact on your diabetes. But in reality, the diabetes and the hypertension uh, have an impact on stones, and stones have an impact on developing these two diseases. Let's look at obesity. It seems as though when we see our stone patients, people sort of tease me, where do you get all these obese patients? Obesity is associated with stones. 
Obesity increases the risk of nephrolithiasis. As you increase the BMI, it increases the risk of nephrolithiasis. And if you have an acute weight gain, 20, 30, 40 pounds, it increases your likelihood of developing a stone. And so on a postmenopausal woman, when they sometimes increase this weight, that puts them at risk for stones. Losing the weight does not decrease your risk of developing subsequent stones. So here are lots of data from a variety of studies. If you look at 150 pounds versus someone who has 22 pounds, the, the person who has 220 pounds increases anywhere from 80 to 90 percent women, less so in men. So the weight has a bigger impact on women. If we look at a BMI, less than 21 versus 30, that older women will have a two-fold increased likelihood of having a stone. And that's why we're seeing all these obese patients. If we look at the weight gain, uh, older women have a 70 to 80% increased likelihood of developing a stone, men not as much. So the, the weight gain is more of the story uh, with women rather than uh, men. BMI greater than 30 is associated with lower urine pH, hyperuric acuric stones, and we talked about elevated uric acid can either form a uric acid stone or a calcium stone, both. Uh, and if you look at, you divide the patients into quintiles, the lower four versus the upper uh, top, the people with the highest quintile have increased urine oxalate, uric acid, and sodium, going along with this uh, BMI story. We looked at, uh, almost 10 years ago now, looking at the LabCorp databases, large uh, databases, and we did find that when you look at the obese patients, they have increased sodium like other people have found now, that they have increased uh, calcium, oxalate, uric acid. And we found only the women had a substantial, substantially increased risk of stones. We didn't stratify it statistically like some of these other groups, but they're finding the exact same data. Right. I think that's an interesting question. And we've actually sort of looked at, you know, what is going on with the obesity. You know that, uh, you know, women, like, let's take laparoscopy. When you do a transperitoneal laparoscopic nephrectomy, I would prefer to operate on a woman rather than a man because they have the sub-Q fat and men have retroperitoneal fat or mesenteric fat. And there's a huge amount of work going on. What, why, do, as men get older, do they have increased mesenteric fat? You get the beer belly and the whole like. So, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of issues in ter terms of looking at where the fat accumulates, whether you're a man or a woman, and no one has really looked at specifically fat distribution in stone formers versus non-stone formers. But we are quantifying, and we have a paper just recently in, uh, accepted, looking at the distribution of fat around the kidney and the retroperitoneum, uh, men versus women, and now we're now stratifying it, looking at stone formers versus non-stone formers. So I think there are going to be certain areas where people gain weight as they get older that may predispose to certain disease processes. I don't know if that answered the question. I, I don't know if people have actually specifically looked at ratios, uh, but that would be an interesting question that maybe we could look uh, with collaborative work together here. Um, you know, we looked at issues uh, at a variety of obesity and 24-hour urine. It's sort of a busy slide, but older women are different than younger women. Older men are different than younger men, and men are different than women in terms of the 24-hour urine constituents when we look at uh, five, 600 patients. But with the obese patients, you know, the, the literature is now packed with this insulin resistance and will probably change the impact on calcium uh, excretion from the proximal and distal tubule uh, with uh, the insulin resistance. So here we looked at our obesity and 24-hour urine, and we found that obesity, again, is associated with increased sodium and uric acid, similar to our study 10 years ago, and a decrease in urine pH. These are real numbers. So metabolic syndrome, we talked about this a little yesterday, five issues. Hypertension, diabetes, obesity, increased triglycerides, and a decreased HDL. Three of the five give you the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. It's epidemic in America, it's probably epidemic here in Canada. Uh, let's look at the metabolic syndrome. Three of the five, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, cholesterol, and HDL, okay. Epidemiologic evidence, people with the metabolic syndrome definitely form stones. Stone formers are at risk of developing the metabolic syndrome. The NHANES database uh, in the States found that if you have one of the five traits versus three of the five traits versus five uh, of uh, the five traits of the metabolic syndrome, your relative risk goes from 20% to 70% to 90%. So the more traits you have of the metabolic syndrome, 
the increased likelihood that you're going to develop a urinary stone. And we see that, you know, the metabolic syndrome in full force versus sort of a mild uh, impact. Uh, a nice Italian group looking at patients with hypertension are at increase with stones. And if you look at those same patients, that if you have obesity plus hypertension, suggesting an additive effect. So there's a couple uh, papers out there sort of showing this additive effect of the metabolic syndrome traits and the impact on uh, uh, urinary stone disease. How much of the increase is uric acid stones? Uh, it's mainly calcium-based stones, okay? Now, they could be hyperuric acid calcium stones, but these studies are specifically looking at calcium versus uric acid stones. So it's not just purine gluttony with uh, increase. It's just weight in general. So it's not necessarily uric acid stones. The distribution of uric acid stone versus calcium is about the same, about 10% versus, you know, 80% for calcium-based stones. The CARDIA database is this amazing database that I have been lucky uh, to get on about, you know, a thousand emails, multiple phone calls. I finally got approvals to sort of leverage this CARDIA database. It's 5,000 Americans recruited in the 80s. And I was sort of part of this when they sort of set it up, but didn't get my name on it early on. And now we're having mature data. It's really amazing database. Uh, we looked at the metabolic syndrome and unequivocally shows that with this cardiac database prospectively 20 years out, you have the metabolic syndrome and almost doubles the risk of, of forming a urinary stone. And where this is in the process of publication. What about family history? We're talking about last night, oh, uh, you know, my, my mom and dad have a stone. So what aspect of stone disease are these controllable factors and what are related to genetics? So we know certain things, the SLC3, 1 and 3, 9 for cystinurics, which are unusual stones, dense disease, looking at CLC and 5, and now they've found a variety of others through the Iceland studies looking at these genetic aspects of urinary stones. So uh, Dave Goldfarb looked at the Vietnam Registry for Twins, very nice study, I think it was in Kidney International, and he looked at monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. These were all male twins, okay? And he found that if you're an identical twin, it doubles the risk of forming the stone, and you can do a very complex statistical analysis called tetrachoric calculation. The guy, this is the guy's name I finally found out, Coric, and it's tetra, they do it. And I know I've been trying to figure out how to do this tetrachoric calculation. And I'll show you in the next slide. I'm working with this Danish twin study, and I got an email. Marshall, have you done this before? I said, no. Would you mind if our statisticians gave it a shot? I said, I'd love it, you know. So they're helping me out doing this. But they found that when you look at these twins, 56% of stones are related to genetics. We know that, you know. So your mom and dad, if we could choose them. But half of it is out of our control. Half of it is, is in our control. So no matter what we do, there's going to be a genetic component of this. And this is really, I think, a, a landmark study that David did. So we, uh, because of this, got excited and got the Danish twin study, larger study, rather than two or 3,000 sets of twins, we now have uh, 30,000 twins. These are now cut, they follow them from age, and everything gets put into this huge Danish twin study. And it's actually interesting maybe for prostate cancer to look at that, but they won't let me look at that. I've asked Peter and I asked them. But these databases are just absolutely amazing. So the problem with this is it's only inpatient data. So we don't have outpatient data. So this is the more severity. We're looking at how many of these twins were admitted for stone disease for the last 30 years. And we found a similar number. Instead of two to one, it's closer to seven to one. So monozygotic twin versus a dizygotic twin, uh, a dramatically different. We're looking at now uh, two boys versus two girls. And if you're a twin and your brother gets a stone, the likelihood of you developing a stone is 90% within that same six month period. So whatever's pre-programmed in these twins, the same thing happens. And then we're looking at uh, you know, non-identical twins, boy, boy, girl, girl, and boy, girl. And so we're just trying to get all this data together, but it will give us more insight and probably will confirm David Goldfarb's data that about 50% of the aspects of stones is genetic in its aspect. It's nothing surprising, but it's nice to at least have data to support that concept. What about race? We looked at race, meaning Asian versus white. And I apologize for all the Asian people here. I clumped them together. Chinese, Korean, you know, I apologize. My wife's Asian, so I, I can get away with that. Okay, so looking at, uh, at the Asians, if you look at the Asians, because we didn't have enough numbers to sort of divide it all up, that Asians have a greater magnitude of hypocitaturia, greater amount of increased uric acid, uh, increased uh, uric acid supersaturation. 
There are differences. Asians are different than whites, okay? And we probably have to spread them out when we go to Singapore. Uh, we, it'd be interesting to look at that, you know? But these are all people living in San Francisco, and we don't know what their diets are. So we don't know if the Koreans are eating Korean diet all the time or if they're eating an American diet. So it's a little trickier to look at, but it would be very interesting to sort of look at 524-hour urine collections and stone histories in Singapore versus what we find here. And in Singapore, they're not going to all be Chinese. There's going to be a mixture there also, right? Okay. Um, so we do the 24-hour urine collection. That's what we do. It just drives me crazy, okay? This has been the same thing that we've had since I started in urology. The only difference is, is that Charlie Pock, Fred Coe, LabCorp has made it very convenient for us to get it. Someone's making a lot of money off of it. But 30 to 40% of 24-hour urines are normal. And we look at this and we say calcium, offset, uric acid, they're all normal, the supersaturations are normal. And we say, hey, you're only peeing 1.47 liters, you need to drink more. And we're transferring the responsibility from the urologist to the patient. It's your fault. It's not their fault. You know, we know that genetically it's 50%, and we need to understand more, and we need to transcend this 24-hour urine collection. And so I will give you my thoughts on that the 24-hour urine is a byproduct and that really the initiation of stone disease has nothing to do with the urines that we're looking at. And when you think about the kidney, it's a vascular sieve. It's the vessels. It's not the urine. The urine is a byproduct. So where's the data to support a vascular theory for stone disease? Alexander Randall, we talked about it a little last night at the, at the dinner. It was a urologist member of GU Surgeons, okay, uh, that he made the comment that stones are beneath uh, the epithelium, and that he said that it was probably associated with the collecting ducts uh, versus uh, the vasorecta of the papilla. This is what they look like. We've all seen them. You see uh, the nice uh, Randall plaques here. We took 150 cadaveric kidneys from the general hospital. We sliced them in half. A couple medical students helped me with this. We put them on a high-resolution mammogram machine, ex vivo, and we started looking at where are these, you know, Randall plaques. Because I was told it's just underneath the epithelium. So here you can sort of see that when you do it under high resolution mammography, that these Randall plaques are going deep. What we're seeing on the papilla is the edge of a nail, okay? And this thing is going deep within the papilla and it's going along some tubular structure. What are the tubular structures there? The vasa recta, which afferent arterial, efferent arterial coming down to the vasa recta, coming on back gobs of those, and the collecting ducts. Statistically, I think I will win because there's more vasorecta than collecting ducts, just statistically, in terms of what's happening. I know that Lingman's group thinks that this is all from uh, the collecting ducts. So here is a schematic of a papilla. We don't really think in these terms. As it goes from the glomerulus down to the papilla, I'll challenge all of us in this room. How many places in the body do you see a, any kind of structure in the body make a 180 degree turn? I mean, it's very unusual to have an artery come all the way back up. It doesn't do that. But in the papilla, it does. And it's for every vasorecta going down, there are four vasorecta going up, and the vasorecta as they go up are fenestrated. That allows for that very hyperosmolar environment. There's three things that put the vasculature at risk from the papilla. One, it's hypoxic. It's an end artery. That's why you have papillary necrosis. And the oxygen tension goes from about 100 in the cortex down to the 60s, down near the tip of the papilla. And if you have a diabetic or you have other issues with cirrhosis, whole chunks of papilla will fall off. You get papillary necrosis because it's low oxygenation. Second, it goes from a laminar blood flow and making a turn to turbulent blood flow. Plumbing problems in the kitchen. It happens where the tight pipes make the turn. Okay, that's obvious. Atherosclerosis happens where you have the bifurcation of the aorta, where the renal artery comes off down in, in the knees. That's where it's going to go from a laminar to a turbulent flow. Third thing, it's going from an osmolality in the normal serum of 320, 340, whatever you're going to call it, down to 1,200 milliosmoles, which allows us to concentrate our urine. So we've got three things hyperosmal uh, environment, hypoxic, and going from a laminar to a turbulent flow. If that's not a setup for a vascular injury, 
I'm not sure what's going to give you that. And that's what we're seeing. I think what we're seeing on a Randall plaque are calcifications of these vasorecta going near the tip of the papilla. And if we can understand what's happening at the vasorecta, we will have a more effective therapy and get beyond that 24-hour urine and come up with a better solution for stones. This is what we do when we look at it. And when you see it, you see the blood vessels. You see the, blood, the, the red cells right here. You see the red cells. It's a tube. And right outside that tube, you see the calcifications, the blue stuff. You look at it in lots of different ways. It's got all these tubes. I think they're closer to the, the vascular structure. Lingeman's group thinks it's closer to the, you know, and it depends upon how you cut it. You can cut it in different ways, and I can show issues where the calcification is closer to the ductal bellini. What is the ductal bellini? How many ducts of bellini per papilla? Ductal bellini, right? When you look at it, you can actually sometimes see the urine coming out the papilla when you look carefully at ureteroscopy. About 12 to 15 ducts of bellini, okay? And remember, the ducts of bellini, a lot of people think the stones happen in the kidney. The ducts of bellini is an inverted cone when you look at it. Smaller diameter, larger diameter. Mother Nature made it so things could get out of there. So it doesn't make sense that something's going to get stuck in the ducts of bellini because it gets larger as it goes towards the papilla. This is a kidney. This is a cast of a kidney. It's just a vascular sieve. That's all it is. And we're seeing the byproduct of the urine. But when you think about it, our blood volume's going through there every two to three minutes. It's the blood. We missed it. I think the blood is the aspect of stones. There's an intimate association between the collecting ducts and the vasorecta. I'm sort of saying it's the vasorecta versus the uriniferous tubules. I may be wrong. I'm going on a limb. I'm making that proposal. What are the issues to give a suggestion that it could be? Sleeping. We talked about that. We sleep, you know, Larry sleeps, what, two hours a night? Three? Three hours a night. Some of us sleep five hours a night. Seem like eight hours. It varies. We talked about when you're young, you hit the pillow, you sleep. How many people sleep on their back? How many on their stomach? How many on their left side? How many on their right side? How many rotisseries? Okay, so we got a few floppers and we got some others. But everybody knows how they sleep. If you go to a sleep lab and you go to these questions, they'll tell you if you sleep on your back, you sleep on your back, you sleep on. So what you perceive you sleep is what you really sleep. We did the study. You look at it. You're on the supine distribution of blood flow 50 50, left side down, dramatic increase, right side dramatic. It changes depending upon how you sleep. And that may be that observation that someone asked last night there's no obstruction, two kidneys. Why does everybody form, why does some people always form a stone on the left side or the right side? It could be a cystineuric, it could be RTA, it could be nephrocalcinosis, it could be a calcium based stones. It's going to be sometimes you find it in that unique fashion. So, you know, we look at uh, electron microscopy of the papilla. You can look at biopsies of Randall plaques. It's controversial. Where are these plaques? Uh, if it is vascular in origin, then we should see some manifestations of vascular disease in stone formers in a greater propensity than those that don't have stones. So let's look at the data, where that comes from. Healthcare professional study. Brian Eisner and I have been working on this for five years. Gary Curran is difficult to work with. Great guy. But finally, we have access to this healthcare professional study. And we wanted to ask the question, if you have stones, is there increased likelihood of having a vascular event? Gary made me sign a piece of paper. If it's a negative study, Marshall, we're going to put this whole thing to rest. I unfortunately didn't get him to sign that if it's positive, we're going to get it published. Okay. So we're still fighting to get this thing published because he does it. But unequivocally, the data is there. 20-year follow-up on these guys, multivariate analysis, looking at incident stone, not prevalent stone. And we found dramatic increase in myocardial infarction in coronary surgery, either using a stent or coronary artery bypass graft being a sort of a surrogate for substantial cardiac uh, disease in stones. And here you can sort of see 16% increase in myocardial infarction, 16% increase in coronary artery bypass, total coronary disease of 15% increase. When you talk about 50,000 people, this is statistically significant. So we see that those with stones in large prospectively enrolled patients have an increase in uh, myocardial infarction, coronary revascularization, giving us a surrogate that, yes, stones are associated with vascular disease. My wife says, huh, what about the women? Okay. 
So we looked at the study of osteoporotic fractures based at UCSF, and I was part of starting this study 20-some years ago. It's a prospective study of five centers, mainly looking at bone health, and I was able to sort of piggyback on looking at kidney health associated with that. And now the, the data's matured 20 years out. We're looking at are these women who have stones at increased risk of heart disease? Multivariate analysis is prevalent disease rather than incident disease, and we looked at myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, and mortality in those with and without stones. The data is as following. Women who have stones have a 78% likelihood increase of having a heart attack. That a woman has a 61% increased likelihood of having angina, and a 2.2-fold increased likelihood of having congestive heart failure. When we see patients in our clinic, this is a canary in the mine shaft. We need to be looking. Those are the patients that we need to intervene to prevent this heart disease. And what do we do? We tell them to have a low-salt diet. We tell them to have a low animal protein intake. We tell them to have increased fluid. We tell them sometimes to go on to a diuretic. These are our, all cardiac healthy diets. We need to do more. So here we see myocardial infarction, angina, congestive heart failure. Mortality was this close from being significant. Okay, and we're now looking at some other databases looking at that if you have a stone, do you have an increased mortality? Going back to the cardio study, we looked at metabolic syndrome before, but what the cardio study is excellent at is they have the ability of looking at coronary calcifications and carotid artery pathology. I mean, this stuff is over my head, but they look at everything. Okay, this is a cardiologist's dream. So we looked at these same patients, and we found that if you have stone, there is increased coronary artery calcifications, okay, such that you're going to need these stents and these, these uh, uh, revascularizations. So we could look at it at an earlier age. You have this increase in cardiac calcifications and looked at carotid pathology, looked at elasticity, stenosis, and everything else. And doing their multivariate analysis, we found that nephrolithiasis is associated with increased coronary uh, carotid artery wall thickness also. So bottom line is, this is just getting published. We're, trying, we're sending this to JAMA to sort of show this data, that nephrolithiasis is associated with increased coronary artery calcifications and increased carotid artery wall thickness. The email flurries on this paper were amazing because there's about 10 of us doing this paper together. And this guy from Tufts, no names, he's on the paper. Marshall, I don't get it. You know, your vasorecta is a vein and the coronary artery is an artery. Arteries and veins are different. And I said, that's true. I think there's an association. So actually, he came up with a very nice idea. He said, what about the vasovasorum? You know, what about, how, you have a coronary artery and there's, you know, the vasovasorum go, are associated with it. Maybe it's the vasovasorum that starts the atherosclerotic cascade. And so for them, we're looking at the impact of coronary stuff on stones, but it may be a new way of looking at atherosclerosis that maybe it's that, that venule associated with the artery that initiates the cascade. So we're now starting some studies looking at the impact of the vasovasorum on the coronary vessel. So it's actually interesting, and it's a way to sort of catch the hook to let them be part of this whole process, and, and, and they like that. What's the take-home message? Take-home message, we don't understand the heck about stone disease. And anybody who wants to go into urology, into academics, I believe it's got a better future than these prostate cancer guys, okay? Uh, the, the traditional theories of urine abnormalities, that's old school. That's what we have today. We gotta look at other stuff. And we need to get beyond that 24-hour urine collection. There's now evidence in my mind that we can hang our hat on it, that linking nephrolithiasis with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, three of the five issues. We didn't look at cholesterol, but we do have data uh, on our initial paper proposing the vascular etiology that stones have a substantial amount of cholesterol in them, and we looked at individual stones. Uh, I think we now are getting anatomic evidence that there's a vascular impact on the initiating focus of the Randall plaques, which I believe is the initiation of the stones. And I think that's going to have an impact on giving us a better armamentarium to treat these patients with urinary stones. So a stone is a stone is a stone. I'd say maybe not. And I think it's actually pretty neat trying to look at these different things. On some of my uh, uh, travels, this is something that I enjoy from Nepal. 
May prosperity reign among you. May good health bless you. May you tread the path of salvation. And may misery never abide among you. This is the own sign outside of the fighter plane squadron in Nepal. So before I got on the plane, I had to take care of that picture. And the quiz question here for Larry, what kind of patient is this that comes in with gross hematuria? You know, we have funny looking patients. You know, at the zoo, you learn a lot about uh, different animals. It is the alpha male of the zoo. It's an orangutan. It's an orangutan. And this thing is massive. Okay. I have a picture. I don't have it on here. The hand is this big, and hematuria ends up had TCC, so some oncology type thing. Okay. But, uh, you know, you learn a lot about stones in the human world. We learn equally amount in, in the veterinarian world. And I'll just leave you with uh, this interesting picture and the thoughts that when we look at our patients with urinary stone disease, I think we need to look at the vascular tree in, in the kidney and sort of uh, try to figure out whether or not that can have an impact on future therapy and a better understanding of urinary stones. So Larry, I'll leave it at that and I'll open it up for questions.